Okay, hi everybody. Um, what we're looking at today is the nervous system. Okay, the nervous system is really important in terms of physical education, sports sciences, um, because it helps us um, make decisions about what we're trying to do. So any skill that we're developing, um, any coordination, etc., is is really a combination between the nervous system and the muscular system, which we've already looked at in, in this semester. So this is really important for both uh, physical educators and sport and exercise scientists. Okay, uh, just a couple of things on the function of the nervous system. Okay, so it has a sensory function in terms of it gathers information. So that's all the senses, uh, touch, sight, taste, sound. Okay, integrative function. So it helps us make decisions about information. So we're receiving information from both the external environment and our internal environment and we're making a decision based on that information and then we act upon that information and the nervous system allows us to that to perform that integrative function and um, it also enables us to perform motor functions so uh, as i said if you're performing any skill in a sport or we're making any decision in a match or in a game and um, that we need to gather that sensory information we then need to act on that information and then perform an appropriate motor function which is the movement of a, of a muscle or a group of muscles uh, to perform a, a particular skill uh, other things that we'll look at today are the divisions of the nervous system so we'll look uh, briefly at the central nervous system which contains both the brain and the spinal cord and then we'll also look at the peripheral nervous system which is made up of the somatic nervous system uh, which includes both sensory and motor neurons and then the autonomic nervous system so which is also further broken into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system which we've already mentioned um, this semester so information comes in from the peripheral nervous system it's then processed in the central nervous system and then we act on that information a message goes back out to the peripheral nervous system uh, for that action to to occur Okay, if we look at these divisions in the nervous system a little bit more closely, so over here on the left you'll see the central nervous system. So the central nervous system consists entirely of the brain and the spinal cord um, and all parts of these interneurons. So these are neurons which are contained totally within the central nervous system. So these two neurons here are particular examples of that. And the peripheral nervous system out here on the right in this simplified diagram is everything outside the central nervous system. So the PNS has two different types of neurons. This is an afferent neuron, which is picking up sensory information and it's relaying it back into the central nervous system. So it's info from the organs back to the central nervous system or it projects into the CNS. And then the second one that we have are the efferent neuron. And these take information from the central nervous system and bring it out to the effector organs. So the particular organ that we're most interested in uh, within this module is the, is the muscle. So if we think of it this way, um, if I put it in a little bit of context, uh, if you're playing a game, a particular sport, and you're about to make a pass, um, first of all, you want to assess the information around you. That might be a call from a teammate, so that's kind of audio sensor, sensory information, and um, you might see uh, another player uh, make a particular run for that pass again that's vision that will be picked up by sensory receptors uh, past this information will pass back through the central nervous system to the brain and the spinal cord via an afferent neuron so afferent neurons send information back into the central nervous system that information is processed here perhaps passed from one interneuron to another within the central nervous system we integrate that information we make a decision so let's say we decide we heard a call we see the run we want to make that pass we then execute the skill so that information is integrated we then decide to actually make the pass uh, and to do that to coordinate the muscle movements to make that pass uh, information is passed through an efferent neuron from the central nervous system out to the periphery and the organ of interest here will be to the muscles so the muscles will contract and they would make that particular pass so that's roughly the process in, in its entirety okay uh, this is the structure of a typical uh, cell within the nervous system so this is a cell from the nervous system is known as a neuron okay and i just want to 
note here that on the left, uh, arrows in red represent the flow of information. So the flow of information moves down in this direction throughout. So we'll start at the top. These branch-like structures here, they're called dendrites, right? And they receive information from other neurons, okay? So if this was an afferent neuron going from the periphery back to the central nervous system, it would be picking up information from our senses, okay? That information, we get lots of connections here, so we're processing lots of information at any given time. And that's integrated here in the soma or cell body, okay? So this is the main cell body of the neuron. So we integrate the information coming from all the different dendrites and all the different connections with different neurons that's integrated here in the soma or cell body. When we integrate that information, cells, uh, neurons do one of two things. They either act or they don't. They either fire or they don't. It's an all or nothing response. So when they receive and integrate this information, they either decide, yes, we need to pass on a message and they fire, or no, we don't need to do anything. Uh, there's no action required of us. So it's an all or nothing response. If they decide that, yes, they've received enough information and they need to pass this information on or act on, on the information, sending out a signal maybe to uh, the muscles, then it will generate what's known as an action potential, which is an electrical signal in the muscle, which or sorry, an electrical signal in the neuron. Uh, and I'll come back to action potentials later. And they do this at this point here in the cell, and that's known as the axon hillock. That action potential sets off a chain reaction of electrical activity moving down the axon. Okay, so this large projection out here is known as the axon. And again, you can see the flow of information. So electrical activity moves down this axon um, and then moves towards these presynaptic terminals. So a synapse is a small gap between the end of the axon and uh, the postsynaptic cell. So this here could be another neuron, like an interneuron, or it could be something like an effector organ, like a muscle cell, all right? So the synapse is a small gap between those. So information moves down from the axon hillock all the way down the axon to these presynaptic terminals, okay? And then it passes on this information to the next neurons in the chain or the next cells in the chain. And the example I'll be using throughout is that these would be a muscle cell, okay? So that's the general structure of cells within the nervous system. Okay, just a reminder here that our afferent neuron carries information back to the CNS, so our sensory neurons, and then the efferent neuron carries information away from the CNS and innervates the effector organ, such as motor neurons, which speak directly to muscle. There are another type of cell within the nervous system, and they are known as glial cells, and their function is to support neurons physically and metabolically. They don't transmit information. They give these other neurons a physical structure and then they support them um, metabolically, meaning effectively that they provide them with energy. Uh, glial cells actually make up 90% of all the cells in the nervous system. They don't function in signal transmission. And these are the different types of uh, glial cells. So we have astrocytes, epidermal cells, microglia, oligodendrocytes, and Schwann cells. And I've highlighted Schwann cells in blue because they're the ones most relevant to what we want to study in this particular module. So oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells form something called a myelin sheath around the axon, so that large projection uh, from, the, from the cell body. And just to give you a look at what that looks like here is, so here's our typical structure. Here's the dendrites, okay? Here's the soma, which is the cell body. And then this is the long axon protect, uh, projection down to the presynaptic terminals down here. And Schwann cells are individual cells repeated along the length of the axon. And I mentioned in the last slide, they provide a, a myelin sheath around the axon. So what that is, it's like a wrapping. And you can see here on the right, it's like layers and layers of plasma membrane and what, what would be on the outside of a cell. So it's think of this like insulation. So if you think of the uh, neurons as the wiring within the body, okay, so to, that conducts electrical activity, um, this is like the insulation wrapped around that particular wiring. And we'll come back later on to why that's important. This is an oligodendrocyte. Um, it's different to a Schwann cell. So a Schwann cell, that's one individual. That's a second individual. That's a third individual, fourth individual Schwann cell. 
Here, oligodendrocytes provide my, multiple myelin sheaths. Uh, you can see here two different axons. So you can see this oligodendrocyte is providing um, some physical structure. It will be aligning these two uh, axons as they're now connected by this oligodendrocyte. And here's just another cross section of the myelin sheet, and you can just see this layers of wrapping and wrapping and insulation around the axon. Okay, and a really important con uh, concept uh, within this particular topic is diffusion. So there are two forces uh, which I'm going to uh, refer to throughout this particular lecture. Uh, one is diffusion, and the other is an electrical force. So we we'll focus first on diffusion. So. Over time, uh, solute molecules placed in a solvent will distribute evenly in all the available space. So though it might be the solute molecules are more dense in this area initially uh, within the solvent or within the liquid, uh, over time they will distribute evenly. So the example that I would give here is if you have a glass of water and you pour in some cordial, initially it will be dense where you poured it in, but over time that cordial will spread uh, throughout the, the glass and you'll, you'll have an even distribution uh, throughout your glass. And so that's a really good visual example of diffusion. So, you know, they will move into all the available space. This is a good, this is a good example of a particular force. So if you have a molecule um, and it's very uh, densely distributed in one area of a solvent, well, actually it will uh, redistribute nice and evenly uh, throughout all the available space. Okay, so what we'll effectively have are concentration gradients. So this is a really good example. If we've got a really high solute concentration here in the left, okay, so a high concentration, and then a low concentration here in the right, and you've got a barrier between the two, well, then they'll both stay where they are. However, if you punched a couple of holes in this barrier, um, what we'll notice is that uh, the molecules will move from the high solute concentration towards the low solute concentration. You will also have some which will try to move back this way, but the overall net flux or net movement of molecules would be from left to right until you ended up with an even distribution across these two areas. So that would be a good example of um, diffusion. So concentration gradients here are really important, and we've mentioned those uh, throughout the, the semester. So that is a force which is acting uh, on molecules uh, within and outside of the cell. So the concentration here in area C1 is greater than C2. Uh, solute molecules will diffuse from compartment C1 into C2 down their concentration gradient. Okay, the second force that I mentioned is charge or electrical force. Okay, so what we see here is, or what we know is, if a molecule is positively charged and another molecule is negatively charged, uh, opposites will attract. So these two molecules here will be attracted to each other and therefore there is a force uh, created between them and that will allow uh, movement. So both of these molecules will move towards each other. A uh, couple of things we know about um, how that force is affected. If we have an increase in the quantity of charge or the quantity of opposites, so uh, an increase in the number of positive ions and an increase in the number of negative ions, well, this charge actually becomes uh, greater, or sorry, this force becomes greater. And we can see that represented by the, the bigger size in terms of the, the arrows here. And then the last thing is that as these ions, these charged ions move closer to each other, that force gets stronger and stronger the closer they are together. So we see something different with uh, like magnetic force. So, you know, if you're going to put a, a fridge magnet on the fridge, there's very little force if you are any distance from the fridge, but as you get closer, you can feel that pull get stronger and stronger. The same is kind of true here for, for electrical force. All right, so just to summarize, we've got two forces acting on molecules uh, within and without of the cell. Uh, they are diffusion, so things will move along their own concentration gradients, so they will move from areas of high concentration to low concentration, and then electrical force. So opposites opposite charges will attract so positive uh, ions will be attracted into areas which are largely negative and negative ions will be attracted into areas which are largely positive okay uh, let's take a look at something then called membrane potential so um, you will likely understand the concept of potential energy 
So if I take a pen and it's sitting on the desk, it has no potential energy. However, if I lift that pen off the desk up to a certain height, it now has a potential energy because if I let go of the pen, it will turn into uh, kinetic energy. Remember, energy uh, cannot be created or destroyed, just uh, converted from one form to another. Membrane potential works in a similar way. So membrane potential is defined as the difference in voltage across the plasma membrane, and this occurs in all cells. So the difference in voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell. Now, remember this term I mentioned earlier on when we looked at the structure of the neuron, Action potentials are rapid changes in voltage across the plasma membrane. So let's just summarize there again. Membrane potential is the difference in voltage across the plasma membrane between the inside and outside of cells. And then action potentials are rapid changes in that voltage across the plasma membrane. Okay, those action potentials are sometimes also referred to as uh, nerve impulses. Electrical transmission of signals along neurons and down the axon depend on the presence of ion channels so that different ions can move across the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's look at resting membrane potential. So here we have a cell, okay, and inside the cell here you can see lots of minuses, okay. So these are lots of uh, negatively uh, charged ions, okay. And outside the cell, you see lots of pluses. You see lots of positively charged ions. So if we were to stick a voltmeter into the cell and look at the difference between voltage between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, we would be looking at their membrane potential. Remember what membrane potential is? A difference in voltage across the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane being on the outside of the cell here. So a difference in voltage between here and here okay the number i want you to remember is in a neuron typically uh, the charge inside the cell relative to the extracellular fluid is negative and the number i want you to recall is minus 70 millivolts so what that says is the inside of the cell compared to the outside is minus 70 millivolts or is negatively charged compared to the outside of the cell Okay, let's have a look here at resting membrane potential and then how it's regulated. So what you see here is this area here, the ICF is the intracellular fluid and the ECF is the extracellular fluid. So this is outside the cell, this is inside the cell, and this here is our plasma membrane. What we have here is something which regulates membrane potential I mentioned earlier are ion channels. So these channels are specific to certain ions and allow them to cross the plasma membrane if they're open. So for example, this is a sodium channel. Uh, you can see sodium is the, are the purple ions which are represented here, and they are positively charged. Okay, so sodium channels, sorry, sodium ions can move in and out of the cell through these sodium ion channels. You see sodium is mainly uh, concentrated outside of the cell. There is some sodium inside the cell, but it is much less concentrated than it is outside the cell. Therefore, have a think for a moment, if diffusion were to occur, which way would sodium move? Would it move from inside to outside or outside to inside? Okay, if you guess from outside to inside, then you will be correct. So sodium will move down its concentration from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. If we look at potassium here, all right, so potassium uh, symbol is K plus here. Again, it's a positively charged ion. Potassium is concentrated inside the cell. Yes, there is some outside the cell, but mostly it's concentrated inside the cell. So if we had a potassium ion channel open, which way would it move? From inside to outside of the cell or outside to inside of the cell? Okay, if you concluded that it would move from the inside to the outside, then you'd be correct. It will move down its concentration gradient, where it's a high concentration, out of the cell, where it's a low concentration, based on diffusion only. Okay, so 
just a couple to bring your attention to a couple of other things. So inside the cell, mainly we have um, potassium, we have some sodium, and then we have some of these large um, negatively charged uh, organic ions. So things like proteins, and they're almost too big uh, to escape the cell. Okay, outside the cell, we have mostly sodium. We have some potassium, but mostly sodium ions. We also have some chloride ions. Okay. Okay, I'm going to refer you to looking at the maintenance of resting membrane potential to the YouTube video uh, that I'll upload alongside this. So at this point, maybe stop, pause this video and take a look at the YouTube video uh, on neuron activity. Okay, maintenance of resting membrane potential. So here again, this is the inside of our cell. Again, you can see the potassium is concentrated inside of the cell. Um, and this is the outside of the cell, and here again you can see that sodium is mainly concentrated outside of the cell. So what type of ion channels do we have? So the type of channel that I showed in, in the last slide is this particular channel, in this case, is what we would call a non-gated potassium channel. And I refer to these channels as leak channels. These are always open, all right? So there's always potassium channels a number of potassium channels open um, within the cell. And that means that potassium can move in and out of the cell um, almost as it pleases, okay, um, in terms of diffusion. Um, there is also a gated sodium channel. So this particular channel is closed unless it receives a, a signal to open. These are more um, prevalent than the non-gated leak channels. So there are only a few of these, there are more of these. Okay, this channel here is a sodium gated channel. So this channel allows sodium to pass through, but again, it is closed at rest uh, unless it receives a particular signal to open. If this particular channel were open, uh, sodium would move down its concentration gradient from outside the cell to the inside of the cell. And then the last type of channel that we have is this sodium potassium pump. But a pump suggests that this requires some active transport. Um, so uh, we know from earlier in the semester when we talked about other type of uh, pump channels uh, that these require ATP to actually function. And what they do is they uh, pump sodium out of the cell and they pump potassium back into the cell. The reason they're going to require energy is if you're pumping sodium out of the cell, it's against its concentration gradient and pumping potassium back into the cell is also against its concentration gradient. Therefore, this is active transport and requires energy. Okay? All right. So, in neurons, when we have some type of stimulus, uh, be it some type of sensory information, maybe it's a sound that we're hearing, that information is going to go back to the central nervous system via an afferent neuron. And it's going to message or speak to or communicate with the other neurons within the central nervous system. And when it does this, it creates something called a graded potential. So graded potentials are produced in response to a stimulus in either the dendrites or cell body of a neuron. And they can be one of two things. They can be a depolarization or a hyperpolarization. So... Remember the dendrites were the little branch-like structures of the, of the cell body of the neuron? They are receiving information from lots of neurons. So when they receive a stimulus, if this causes positive ions to enter the cell, then these will be seen as a depolarization. Now remember, the inside of the neuron, relative to the outside, was what particular millivoltage? minus 70 millivolts, right? So the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell is negative. So if positive ions enter the cell via the stimulus, that will create a depolarization because the inside of the cell compared to the outside is polarized. It's opposite. It's negative compared to the outside. So we will depolarize it by making it more positive, bringing it closer to zero from minus 70. If that's a small stimulus, it would be a small depolarization as only a small number of positive ions would enter. If that's a larger stimulus, we get a larger depolarization, okay, depending on the number of positive ions that enter. 
we can have summation of these graded potentials. So they're graded in terms of their size. So they can be uh, summated by either um, spatial or temporal. So spatial summation will be several stimuli happening at the same location at the same time. Okay, so here's our resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. We receive three uh, graded potentials in close proximity. This will be temporal summation. You can see that the effect of depolarizations are added together or summed together, temporal summation. And if this depolarization reaches a threshold and results in generation of an action potential in, at the axon hillock. Okay, so here, for example, Here's our resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. Here we've received a stimulus. Very quickly after, we've received another positive stimulus, another positive stimulus, and another one. If they summate to what we call threshold, okay, so this word is very important, then we will generate an action potential. Take a second, try and recall what was the definition of an action potential. Okay, well done if you got this. An action potential is a rapid change in voltage across the plasma membrane or a rapid change in membrane potential. So at rest, our membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts. When depolarization reaches threshold, we get this rapid depolarization, a rapid change up to plus 30 millivolts in membrane potential. That is an action potential. It then repolarizes back to around minus 70 millivolts uh, immediately after in a very short space of time. So this here is a rapid change in membrane potential. That is an action potential in terms of electrical activity. Okay, why are action potentials important? Well, they're the basis for every sensation, so every sense that you have, every memory, every thought that you're having right now, the learning that you're doing in class, is all about action potentials. Action potentials are generated, if you remember at the beginning, at the axon hillock of the neuron. They are propagated down the axon, okay, without a decrease in intensity. And we mentioned at the beginning, they are an all or nothing response. They're generated by uh, neurons, muscular cells, and some other receptor cells. And these action potentials are orchestrated by sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels, which we mentioned a couple of slides ago. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more visually. Here's resting membrane potential, okay? Remember where sodium is concentrated? Outside the cell. Potassium is concentrated in yellow here, inside the cell. This is a gated sodium channel, so it's gated. You can see at this point it's closed at rest. And this is a gated potassium channel, also closed at rest. Remember what our resting membrane potential is? It's minus 70 millivolts. So at this point in time, sodium and potassium are not moving uh, because the, the channels that were represented here are both gated channels, and at the moment they're both closed. Okay, imagine a signal comes to uh, this sodium-gated uh, channel uh, and tells this sodium channel to open. So when it opens, recall, where is sodium concentrated? Yes, outside the cell. So therefore, it's going to move down its concentration gradient by diffusion, isn't it? So it's going to move from outside the cell to inside the cell. Now, what charge does sodium have? Is it positive or negative? That's right, it's positive. So positive ions now entering the cell what are they going to do to the resting membrane potential? So remember, membrane potential is inside of the cell relative to the outside. So the relative to the outside piece is really important. So as sodium ions enter with their positive charge, the outside is losing positive ions and the inside is gaining positive ions. So therefore, the inside of the cell relative to the outside is becoming less negative or more positive okay it's moving towards from minus 70 towards zero and that's called depolarization okay repolarization occurs 
when the potassium, so the sodium gated channels closed and the potassium channels open. So potassium is concentrated inside the cell. Okay, so therefore by diffusion, we'll move down its concentration gradient and move outside the cell. Potassium charges, uh, potassium ions are positively charged. Therefore, the inside of the cell loses positives to the outside of the cell. Therefore, this makes the inside of the cell more negative again. Okay, so it loses positive ions to the outside of the cell. So we have repolarization. Okay, and both channels are closed at this point in time. That process there is a rapid change in membrane potential that is known as an action potential. And it relies on sodium gated and potassium gated ion channels. So the sodium gated channels open first. Sodium rushes into the cell down its concentration gradient, making the inside of the cell more positive compared to the outside. That those channels close, the potassium channels open, and potassium leaves the cell. So that's positive ions leaving the cell, making the inside of the cell uh, more negative, repolarizing it. When they do this, sometimes they over uh, they over kind of uh, react. So more potassium ions leave the cell, and what we get is this uh, reduction in the membrane potential below 70, and we call that hyperpolarization so it's become more polarized and during this hyper so here's our depolarization and repolarization and we've slightly hyperpolarized here in this area marked in blue we are now further away from the threshold so at this point we call this the absolute refractory period okay or the relative refractory periods the absolute refractory period is during the action potential and the relative refractory period is immediately post because we are further away from threshold it will take a stronger stimulus for us or a greater number of stimuli to bring us to threshold so therefore the cell is less responsive immediately after an action potential okay and will only fire if the signal is really strong or really frequent Okay, to have another action potential. Okay, let's talk about propagation or the movement of action potentials. So factors affecting propagation are the absolute refractory period. Okay, so during the absolute refractory period, which occurs during the action potential, we cannot have another action potential during that time. And that means that uh, during the absolute refractory period, uh, Action potentials will only move in one direction down the axon. They will not move back up the axon. The axon diameter is another factor. So if you think of the, the neurons as the wiring of the body, um, if you want more information to pass more quickly, do you think you need really thin wiring? Or do you think more uh, thick, broad diameter wiring would send more information? Well, the answer is the latter, okay? Uh, a broad or... A, greater diameter axon can pass more information more readily more quickly so it speeds up propagation the other factor is myelination so remember what created a myelin sheath along the axon if you remember that the schwann cells uh, created myelin sheath along the axon really well done and we're going to look at those in a moment because they predicate uh, this a concept known as saltatory conduction. So myelin, we call this the insulation around the wiring, is resistant to ion movement across the plasma membrane because of this wrapping and this insulation. The longitudinal resistance within the axon is really, really low, and that allows huge uh, movement of the action potential and allows it to jump from one node to node of RAM VA. I'm going to look at what, what they are right now in a little bit more detail. Okay, so here is my axon, and I'm going to say that this is the direction of flow from left to right. Okay, so let's pretend the axon hillock is up here, and the action potential has been generated in this area, and this is the flow towards the presynaptic terminals. Uh, here you see one, two, three, four individual Schwann cells and they are providing the myelin sheath um, and wrapping this insulation around the axon. Here we can see our sodium channels or our ion channels 
are now present in these gaps between the Schwann cells. And these gaps, each of these are known as nodes of Ranvier. Okay? There are no ion channels in these areas where there is myelin, where myelin is wrapping around the axon because it is blocking them. All right. So no ions can move in this area or this area. Okay. They can only move in this area and this area across the plasma membrane. Okay. So what happens is our sodium channels open first. Sodium rushes into the cell, right down its concentration gradient, and then it will diffuse within the cell. So that will make this area of the cell more positive relative to the outside. So we'll have a rapid change in membrane potential. We'll have an action potential in this area. Some of these sodium ions will diffuse down this direction and this signals to these sodium channels to open. Sodium in this area will move down its concentration gradient into the cell, making this area of the cell more negative or sorry, more positive relative to the outside, again, causing an action potential. The same will happen down here. Sodium will rush into the cell, making the inside of the cell more positive relative to the outside of the cell. Again, a rapid change in membrane potential, another action potential. So what's happened is we've an action potential in this area, an action potential here, an action potential here, an action potential here, like a domino effect. And that speeds up the propagation of the action potential down the, the length of the axon. Okay, at this point, I'll refer you uh, to the Schwann cell and the action potential uh, in the YouTube clip uh, that I've attached uh, to this particular piece. So I'll give you a moment to, to go and uh, check out that video, uh, which has narration and will explain this particular concept.